and welcome to another Ask Zach. Today we are going to spotlight Fred Newell, the Nashville Network and the TV show Nashville Now that ran for 10 years and was a live TV show and also this custom guitar that Fred had made to, uh, to use on the show and to uh, kind of spotlight the network. So this is going to be fun. Uh, such an important guitar player, so visible. Uh, you know, this guy was on live television five nights a week for an hour and a half on one of the biggest you know cable stations of the 1980s and early 90s so yeah we're going to talk about fred newell all right so if you've been watching the show and you haven't subscribed yet well then go down in the corner and please do that if you've already subscribed then i appreciate you supporting the show which is what you know keeps it going so there is tip jar information in the description there, uh, you know, you can become a friend of Ask Zach and you can support the show on a monthly basis. I'm so appreciative of everyone that has done that. And then also we have merch at askzach.com. You can find things like this, uh, you know, kind of amp blueprint that has a little Ask Zach logo down here. Or, uh, you know, hats and, uh, you know, coffee mugs and all sorts of stuff. All right, so let's, uh, let's get on to... Uh, onto the topic at hand. So first we're going to talk about Fred Newell. Then we'll talk about, you know, this, this guitar and, and the Nashville Network and, and, and all that. So Fred Newell was born in, in Southern Illinois in the early 1940s. And he began playing the guitar, got really serious about it, and he went to, uh, you know, he went to, you know, to a university and studied music and, and graduated from there. And then, uh, yeah, you know, he was playing club dates and not making very much money. And uh, he was kind of hooked up with uh, Christy Lane and her husband. Uh, Christy Lane, of course, uh, became, you know, famous for, you know, a, a gospel tune. But uh, she had been a, you know, regular country singer. You know, she had a hit with One Day at a Time. So he was playing with them and ended up moving to Nashville. And once he got to Nashville, he started, uh, you know, in the early 70s, he got a, a series of, of road gigs, including a stint playing with Waylon Jennings to fill in for his steel player, Ralph Mooney. And uh, because, uh, you know, Fred was really good at doing steel licks on guitar. So uh, also he toured with uh, Lynn Anderson and uh, Tom Paul Glazer, who was one of the outlaws and also earlier one of the Glazer brothers that sang on El Paso with Marty Robbins. And uh, yeah, to, you know, did some work with Jerry Reed and uh, you know, started getting into session work. Um, and, and that's where things really you know, kind of made a, a big you know, turn for him was he played on the Kendall's uh, big hit song called Heaven's Just a Sin Away. And on it, he played, you know, low string stuff on a Telecaster, which in the 1970s was not common. And he, of course, gives uh, credit to the, the producer for uh, telling him to do that. But, you know, that really gave him a sound and producers started calling him because, you know, that thing that was common on Buck Owens records and other things back in the 60s, Bakersfield stuff, uh, Red Simpson, on and on. Uh, it wasn't common in Nashville at that point. People weren't playing Telecasters and they weren't playing low string things. And so he started getting work because of that. And his session career 
really flourished. And uh, Fred really doesn't get um, kind of the, the credit or the accolades, uh, you know, for all the stuff he played on. He played on the early George Strait stuff, like Unwound and uh, Fire You Can't Put Out, Marina Del Rey, you know, uh, that's the stuff that uh, Blake Mevis uh, was was producing before, uh, you know, before it moved on to other producers and Reggie Young and then later on Brent Mason playing on the George Strait stuff. Also, Fred played on the early Alabama hits like, you know, Mountain Music, Tennessee River, Roll On, uh, Dixieland Delight. So there were, of course, Jeff Cook, who's the guitar player in Alabama, who was a good player, but wasn't really used to doing studio stuff. And so they would bring in Fred kind of as a bit of a ringer to, to help out. And so uh, I, I talked with Fred about this and he was very, very humble about it, but just saying that, that he and, and Jeff Cook would collaborate on stuff. And so so sometimes it's Jeff and sometimes it's Fred on those on those tunes. So uh, there you have it. All right, and so things for Fred really took another turn while he was still working with Lynn Anderson uh, in the in the 1970s. They were playing on a television show called Pop Goes the Country that was hosted by Ralph Emery. Well, the music director for that show was Jerry Whitehurst. And Jerry Whitehurst saw Fred playing with Lynn Anderson, and he asked him if he could do a club date that night. And he did, and all of a sudden, Jerry started asking him, said, would you like to do some television work? Because Jerry was, you know, involved in different, uh, you know, kind of country music television shows that were being filmed in Nashville. And Fred said yes. Well, it ended up being uh, very fortuitous because he started playing on the Porter Wagner show and he started playing on a, on a variety of things. And, uh, and then, uh, in 1983, there was the launch of a new cable network called the Nashville network. And Jerry Whitehurst contacted, uh, Fred and said, there's going to be a, a flagship television show. It's going to be on five nights a week for an hour and a half, and it's going to be live, and it's going to be a music variety show, and then it's going to be hosted, you know, by, by Ralph Emery, and would you like to be, you know, the lead guitar player? Well, Fred said he had to think about it, but he, uh, but he agreed, and it ended up being a hugely popular television show. Uh, you know, you know, the Nashville Network ended up being incredibly popular. And then, of course, Nashville Now was the flagship show. And so for me and many others of you out there that were growing up and learning how to play guitar, especially in the 1980s, you know, we were always starved for guitar input. And so it didn't matter what it was. You just wanted to see somebody play guitar well. And so when I was, you know, at a home where there was cable because my dad didn't let us have cable for a long time. Um, I would basically float between the Nashville network and MTV. And so if it was like a game show or something crazy on the Nashville network that wasn't really music oriented or I didn't like whoever the musical guest was, I'd watch you know MTV and hopefully it was a good music video. And again, that was back when MTV played music videos instead of reality TV shows and things like that. So... Fred Newell was on live television for an hour and a half, you know, a night, Monday through Friday. So again, the pressure was on. I mean, if you screwed up, it was there for everyone to see. And the show was rerun three times within 24 hours. So it, it, it would come on from seven to eight 30 and then it would be shown again that night. And then like two more times, during the, the late evening and, and early morning the next day. And then, of course, there'd be the next show. So, again, it ended up being an incredibly popular show. And every country star was on it. Uh, and, you know, they would have rehearsals, uh, you know, in the afternoon. And, uh, you know, Fred would have to, you know, learn all these different parts. Because sometimes an artist would bring their band. Sometimes they wouldn't. And, uh, yeah, Fred was always having to learn all these different guitar parts. So he had different guitars. Uh, this was kind of his main one, but he, you know, he would have all sorts of guitars in a closet, you know, just depending on what was needed, uh, for that artist. 
And uh, he did a, a lot of really neat things. Uh, one, he was lucky in that all the songs would be charted beforehand in the Nashville number system. But then uh, he would keep a little tape recorder, you know, this, you know, kind of getting uh, back in olden times, you know, they'd have these little mini cassette recorders and he would keep one just to record intros and solos on so that he could remind himself. Because you have to remember, this guy's playing on live television five nights a week with all these different artists. So he's having to remember all these intros, outros, and solos. And so he would record them. And then during a, a commercial break, he could listen back to what he was going to play next to kind of remind him. Even though he had already learned it, of course, he needed a reminder. And I can't tell you how many times I wish that I would have done that, you know, just in different gigs that I've had where, you know, all of a sudden you've had to learn, you know, all these songs. And all of a sudden it's like, it's like the, the next song is, uh, you know, you, you see the title of it, it's on the set list and you're like, the song could be, you know, cinnamon graham cracker or something like that. I, I couldn't remember it all. And I'm having to ask one of the other players, can you just hum the intro? I know it, but I just can't remember <laughs> which one it is. So anyway, um, yeah, so the show was extremely, po extremely popular. Of course, everyone and their dog was on it, you know, in country music and outside of it, you know, Les Paul, Chet Atkins, uh, you know, of course, Ricky Skaggs, Steve Warner, you know, Jerry Reed, uh, you know, and, and gospel people and CCM people and all, all sorts of acts were on that show, uh, the monkeys, uh, because it was, it was an incredibly popular show with a huge audience. And it ran from 1983 to 1993. Now, the show didn't end because anyone didn't want to do it anymore or that it was starting to lose popularity. No, it was incredibly popular. But the, uh, the owners of TNN, they, uh, they decided they wanted, wanted to embrace a, uh, a younger demographic. And so they felt like Ralph Emery was too old. The players, everything was, was, you know, a bunch of middle-aged and, and up people. And even those, you know, doing so well, they, uh, they shut down the show and they started a, a new show and, uh, and it didn't do well. And they changed host. Uh, you know, they, uh, they went from Amy Grant's first husband who was, uh, you know, he was the host of it for a little while, not Vince Gill. Um, then you had uh, Tom Wopat, who was one of the uh, Dukes of Hazard, the dark-haired Duke brother, um, or cousin, or whatever they were. And uh, and then they, they, they tried to get uh, Crook and Chase, who had hosted like a news show on there and had been DJs, and they had done well. But by that point, they had really lost their market, and, uh, and they lost their audience. And, uh, so that finally went away. And then TNN, uh, was, it became like all sorts of different things. It changed names. It became the man network or something like that. But anyway, TNN's long gone now, but, uh, for its time, it was amazing. It was so, so much fun, you know, to watch the show and to see, uh, just all the different musicians and equipment and, and all sorts of stuff. So, Let's talk about this really cool, iconic guitar that was, you know, seen, you know, just, you know, probably one of the most visible, you know, electric guitars you know, on television of the 1980s and early 90s. So early on, when they first started the show, Fred got the idea to have a guitar made that would have the logo of the network on it. So this, is, this was the, the logo of the Nashville network. And he went to the producers of, of, of the show and he said, I want you to pay for a guitar to be made with the, the logo on it, but I'm going to own it. It's going to be my guitar. And so they agreed to it. So he bought, so Fred bought some parts. So, and I, and I took this apart and this was really cool because I had kind of forgotten about this, but the body and neck are made by DiMarzio. And so I had forgotten that uh, DiMarzio had made all sorts of bodies and necks and, uh, and hardware besides making pickups. And they were, you know, real into cables and strap locks and all sorts of things uh, during the, the early, oh, kind of all through the 1980s. So this is a 57 V shaped DiMarzio neck. And this is one of their Telecaster bodies. 
And then he had a, a, a gentleman named A.J. Nelson who worked at the Showbud uh, shop, which of course was down on Broadway where Roberts is. So the place where all the Telecaster guys, you know, play, you know, that they used to be Showbud. That was where they made pedal steel guitars and, and worked on guitars. So, uh, yeah, Fred got a DiMarzio body, DiMarzio neck. These are, you know, Shaler machine heads. Uh, this is an actual Fender bridge. These are Fender pickups, uh, probably, you know, 70s. Uh, they've been, looks like they've been potted. Uh, and then it has, you know, normal, you know, kind of uh, setup of vo volume and tone. Uh, it's really interesting. He put Loctite on these screws so that they won't move, which was really smart. Uh, then also these, uh, the intonation screws have been bent down. He hammered them down so they wouldn't eat into his palm. And then he ground down the height adjustment screws so that they wouldn't eat into his palm too. So they would be, you know, down into the, the saddle itself. <laughs> he, uh, this selector switch is black and it's been painted white. And you can see that some of the white's coming off here on the edge. Uh, the base plate of the rhythm pickup was painted white. So it, you know, would, uh, would blend into the guitar appearance. Of course, this was silk screened on and it says the Nashville network. And then it says, uh, SM, which is service mark. Uh, it has these knob ease, uh, knobs, which is very eighties. That was, uh, and these, you know, of course have a really good grip on them and are really, uh, really nice. The guitar is completely shielded. It has shielding paint in it, uh, to reduce as much noise as possible when playing on, uh, on television. And then, uh, Fred was kind enough to one, he invited me over to his house and went over to his house, uh, for a bit, you know, a couple days ago. And, uh, he told me about, you know, uh, kind of the inspiration for the guitar. And that's that, you know, he was of course, one of the, one of the guys playing a Telecaster in the seventies in, uh, in Nashville. And apparently, you know, people would say the Telecaster was a redneck guitar. See where we're going here. So he decided when he had this guitar made up, he said, I want the neck to be red because I want it to be a, a redneck guitar. <laughs> so I just thought that was uh, quite funny. So here we have the redneck Nashville network uh, guitar that, uh, you know, and then here, here's the back. Yeah, you can really see the, uh, the logo well. Yeah. And then this, this guitar, well, this is kind of, it's also, uh, Fred Newell has, has signed the back of the headstock. And then also the, uh, the create, the person that put the guitar together, AJ Nelson, uh, signed it. And then if you see here on the front of the headstock, it says, you know, made for Fred Newell by AJ Nelson. And it says, uh, 1983 right here. So now this guitar is not owned by Fred Newell. So another, uh, a friend of mine here in Nashville, owns the guitar and he was kind enough to loan it to me. So thank you, John. And, uh, the reason Fred doesn't have it is because at the end of their 10 year run, uh, you know, he had become so invested in the show and such, and he was still doing session work, but not like he was before. So his session career was a lot bigger, you know, playing on like the George Strait stuff in Alabama and things like that. And then it kind of curtailed some, you know, when he started playing on this television show, you know, five nights a week. And so then he was so invested in this television show that, you know, after 10 years of, of great success, and, and then all of a sudden it was over, he was really depressed. And so he sold off most of the guitars that he played on the show. And he played a lot of different guitars on the show. I mean, this one was kind of his main one, but he loved, you know, just kind of, you know, playing crazy, sometimes really gaudy looking guitars. He played like these bass boat sparkle GNL a sats. He played Kramer's and PV. And, uh, he had some Gibson, he had a Howard Roberts with a Trini Lopez headstock that was covered in mother of pearl. And it had all this, you know, crazy decoration on it. It's kind of the counterpart to John Jorgensen's, uh, Epiphone that has the yellow submarine, but this one had all sorts of stuff from Nashville and the Nashville now show and uh, Yeah, and uh, also uh, kind of an aside Fred had uh, You know, he had an amplifier endorsement with Marshall and uh, he was you know He was shown in uh, Marshall ads in the in the late 80s 
uh, and played a Silver Jubilee half stack on his show. Uh, earlier on, he played a Showbud amp, a little one with a D120. And uh, he said he just used a variety of, of little pedal effects. He said he had a Pearl a little effects pedal board that he would plug stuff into. And but, that usually he would have something like maybe an overdrive, a chorus, uh, maybe a, a you know phaser if he needed it, maybe a delay, something like that. And uh, yeah, it didn't use a whole lot of effects. And uh, yeah, you know, and then yeah, he had endorsements with PV and Tube Works. And, and that was a, a big deal to have your uh, guitars or amps or whatever it was, you know, on display, you know, five nights a week for an hour and a half on, uh, on a, a very popular uh, cable network. So, yeah. So after the show ended, uh, again, he sold off a bunch of guitars and he dove, you know, headlong into playing pedal steel guitar. And so he had played pedal steel earlier, uh, but he had, you know, kind of shifted to where he was mainly playing guitar. And so after, after Nashville now was over, he shifted to pedal steel guitar and, you know, he started playing down on Broadway and uh, just to get better at pedal steel guitar. And then he played with uh, Waylon Jennings for, uh, uh, you know, an, quite a few years up until probably the the final tour or so i think the final tour was rob robbie turner came back for that but uh yeah fred played steel with him and he continues to play well up until richie albright who was Waylon's drummer they continued to do kind of a waymore's outlaws thing and uh and fred was part of that with some of the other uh Waylon, uh veterans so yeah that's kind of the story of this uh you know, cool guitar. As far as, you know, the sounds, of course, what I was playing at the beginning was the, um, the Nashville Now theme song. And, uh, just here's the, uh, you know, here's how the, the guitar sounds. So here's the, the neck pickup, which is really dark. Oh. Here's both. And the back pickup. Yeah, good sounding guitar, and uh, yeah, real, really iconic. Really, really fun to get to uh, play this thing and talk about it. I hope you've enjoyed this. I need to thank uh, again John Stokes for letting me borrow this beautiful guitar. And I need to thank Fred Newell for inviting me down to his house and kind of giving me the lowdown. And then also I need to give credit to uh, John Sievert and, uh, for his article in Guitar Player Magazine. So this is the uh, 1988 Clapton issue of uh, Guitar Player Magazine. That this is, I, I, I bought this in 1988 and uh, you know, I still have it because it's one of my favorite issues. And uh, it has a really nice spread by John Sievert on Fred and there he is holding the guitar and uh, yeah so thanks to John thanks to Fred and uh, of course John, thanks to John Stokes I hope you've enjoyed it thanks to everyone that has supported me picked up the shirt or friends of Ask Zach uh, I really appreciate it all right thanks bye-bye mm -hmm.